This is I Don't Speak German. I'm Jack Graham, he, him, and in this podcast I talk to my friend Daniel Harper, also he, him, who spent years tracking the far right in their safe spaces. In this show we talk about them and about the wider reactionary forces feeding them and feeding off them. Be warned, this is difficult subject matter. Content warnings always apply. Yes, it's bonus number seven. You lucky people, you're listening to it. That means you give us money. Or you've pirated it, I don't know. <laughs> we've released it to the public at some point in the future. <laughs> we might have done. We've done that now with uh, one of our bonus episodes. We released yep. Punishment Park to the public because we, we've we been a bit behind this month with what with one thing and another. We've had a but, busy uh, summer, both of us, I think, is, is kind yeah. of the issue here. <laughs> yeah. 30 so, minutes before we start recording, we go like, uh, can we push this till tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> And it's happening increasingly often these days. Right. But no, we finally, we finally made it. And uh, yeah, in case that, in case you are listening to this in the future, months after we recorded it and released it for our wonderful Patreon backers, uh, we are recording this on the. Well, what is it now for me? Has it actually rolled it, over? Yeah, it is it's the thirtieth. Where you are, yes. It is the thirtieth of July, uh, twenty twenty one. The best year ever. And uh, Daniel, I think, is still stuck in the 29th of July, right. like a dweeb. Yeah, well, N- not like me, in, in, in way ahead in time. And um, yeah, we, we've um, we have made up, I think, a little bit for our uh, our uh, wobbly, unproductive July by just we just released episode 90 of the main show, which is a fucking banger. I think I'm very <laughs> pleased with that one. Lots of lots of references to ivermectin and scientific studies. Uh, yes, indeed. Yeah, I just, I just, uh, I just hate Brett and Heather so much. I love kicking the boot in. You know, <laughs> hate them. Um, but this isn't about them. We're taking a break from kicking Brett and Heather. <laughs> Although they might come up, who knows? It is. I don't speak German these days, and uh, Brett yeah. and Heather never far from our minds. Uh, I don't speak German increasingly now, just a, an IDW podcast, but there you go. That's, I wonder how that, how did a podcast that started off being about Nazis turn into a podcast about the IDW? I just can't, I can't understand this, Daniel. What? It's, it's so obscure. Yeah. How, how did this, how did this happen? Yeah. No. It's almost, what happened? Almost as if there's yeah. some connection anyway. there. Anyway. Yeah. Almost as if, almost as if, but to finally get to the point. Yes, we're talking about uh, this bonus episode is about In the Loop, which is a movie that was released in 2009, uh, directed by Armando Iannucci. Iannucci, Iannucci. Uh, I should know how to say that because I've been listening to him for a very long time. Um, My first exposure to Armando Iannucci was um, as uh, like the third or fourth person on with them. uh, Stuart Lee and Richard Herring on the TV show, uh, TV radio comedy program, uh, Lionel Nimrod's Inexplicable World, which is uh, also featured Tom Baker for the, oh. for the for the who heads who might be listening. Uh, Armando was like uh, the uh, the third cast member on that uh, in the, in their show, and I remember listening to that when I was a student. But yeah, uh, total byway. Forgot about it. Um, written by him and Tony Roach, Tony Rock, something like that. Simon Blackwell and Jesse Armstrong, starring Peter Capaldi, Tom Holland, and Gina McKee, James Gandolfini, and Chris Addison. I suppose he's the. Uh, I suppose he's the nerdy aide. He's with the glasses. Toby. Yeah, Toby. That's right. And uh, oh, that's funny. Wikipedia doesn't have the uh, the woman that plays the American politician in the or or. Um, uh, her aide, Anna, uh, Ch- Anna Ch- Chil- Chlump- Chlumsky. Chlumsky. I can't say yep. anybody's name. Um, <laughs> Mimi Kennedy. Yeah, she's not listed. The women aren't listed in the in the starring bit on Wikipedia. This is rank sexism. Definitely, for sure. Yeah, or David Rash, actually, for that matter. Um, who's in it as well? David Rash. I don't know. People might remember him as Sledge Hammer, 
I used to watch that when I was a kid. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> lots of people, lots uh, of people went on to do to do other stuff uh, because, like Zach Woods, the uh, the, the creepy omen child, um, he did a I think a season or so of uh, the American Office uh, down the line. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, Anna Chlumsky, uh, do you do you know what she's best known for? By the way, it, wasn't she in a? Wasn't she in movies as a kid? Wasn't she in she a was. um, Macaulay Culkin film? She was. She was in My Girl and My Girl Too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The one the one where spoiler alert, uh, Macaulay Culkin uh has his first on-screen kiss. Um and I think his first like real kiss ever. He was uh, like 12 at that point. And uh he uh dies after being stung by a bee. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um I I saw that movie theatrically when I was a small child and uh <laughs> like I I have fairly fond memories of it honestly. Uh it's got like Dan Aykroyd and uh uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, um, and it's it's a kind of a a charming kind of like a slice of life kind of story. Um, wow, I've yeah. I've never seen it. I've never yeah. seen it. Well, I just remember the the um, poster, you know, with um, <laughs> Macaulay Culkin and uh, a girl who uh, right. I recognized. I actually recognized her when I was watching this. I was thinking, that's the girl that was in that movie with Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> first, the first time I saw this movie, I definitely had that moment of like, where do I know? Where do I know you from? And then suddenly you realize you go like, holy crap. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. definitely. Definitely a moment. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, yeah, I I'd completely forgotten David Rash was in this and I used to love Sledgehammer. I used to stick. I was when I, because I'm so old now. Um, I remember when TV used to just stop at night tv when, right. when i was a kid tv used to bbc you just you say yes uh, thank you for watching bbc we're closing down now and then they play the national anthem at you and then the tv would go Boo! for hours a joke that um that from the young ones people will will people who know the young ones will 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 remember that um but yeah that's the thing i remember that and itv used to itv used to um ITV used to, I think, used to quit a bit earlier than the BBC, if I remember rightly. Um, but I remember when ITV started going all the way through the night, and that was like a big thing, especially for us kids. We were like, right. oh, t- TV just goes on all night now. And, uh, of course, we'd all stay up and watch it. And I um, I remember I used to watch um, stuff like they used because, of course, they used to put El Cheapo American shit that they just <laughs> imported, you know, on, on in the middle of the night when nobody was watching. So I used to as a kid, 11 years old or whatever, I was staying up till 4 a.m. to watch WKRP in Cincinnati and um, <laughs> nice. married with children. Yep. And yep. Uh, and Sledgehammer. And I, I, I fucking I have very fond memories of all this. At a, at a certain point, uh, you know, all the uh, all the uh, U.S. channels would just go to what they called paid programming, and those were uh-huh. uh, infomercials. And so, you know, after you know midnight, twelve thirty, one o'clock. I mean, if you were if you were insomniac as I was, as, you know, as a you know thirteen year old, uh, eventually everything just turned into like paid programming. Um, and so you were just watching, uh, you know, slice and dice, uh, you know salad cutters or whatever yeah for yeah. for four hours until like the morning routine kind of comes up again but uh yeah it's yeah. Got, the same thing kind of repeated itself on satellite television at least in this country at least i don't know it's i i don't really have television now i don't have sky or anything like that i don't have cable so um but, but when i used i did have sky for a while and there were, it was the same thing. It used the programs, the actual programs used on a lot of the channels, the actual programs would just stop. And then you'd get endless just adverts about, oh, buy this compilation of rock anthems or <laughs> buy <laughs> this food blender or whatever. Right, right. Yeah. Just no, going t- through the bunch, you know, a bunch of Time Life infomercials uh, over here. <laughs> you know, oh, right, yeah. The Time yeah. Life books, uh, you know, Mysteries of the Ancient World. Yeah. And it's really yeah. like the same three minutes of content they just repeat over and over again. Yeah. And uh, it's basically they've turned that into the History Channel now, haven't they? <laughs> Pretty uh, much, yeah. Well, you know, but, God, uh, I mean, we could probably there's probably an episode in you know, talking about like basic cable and the uh, the sort of incentives <laughs> there. We could definitely talk about how uh, how that is uh, um, you know, affected as sort of the you know international political culture, certainly American political culture. Um, yeah, yeah. There's I'm definitely sure. something there, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I'm kind of fascinated by the 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 degeneration of the History Channel and the, or is it the Discovery Channel? I don't know. Into all like all of them, they, they, they yeah, all, they all do it. Yeah, they they're like conspiracy theory mills now. You know, they 
I mean, I remember I when I had Sky, it was very uh, satellite television is what I mean when I say Sky. Right. Um, that's what we, again, I don't even know anymore because I'm so old and it's been so long. But um, it used to be like satellite television in Britain was just Sky and you'd, you'd buy a, a, a Sky dish and get a Sky box, etc. And you'd have the History Channel and you could watch um, documentaries about the Nazis all day. That's, <laughs> yeah that's pretty much what they did yeah, yeah. yeah that's it but now now it's kind of the nazis and did the, the did the aliens build the pyramids isn't it right see this is interesting to me because uh over here you did have this kind of time period i mean you can get like a satellite tv here but it was always this sort of thing that was more uh like rural people out where the cable companies just wouldn't run lines sort of thing it's because we have this giant country that's just filled with like people who want to get television <laughs> and the way to do that is is mm. with a satellite dish um and i guess there was an era in which they were like kind of advertised a little bit more aggressively but i never like my family never had one i never you know i never there was never an issue we, we just we had we had cable most of my life growing up um and when i was very small it was like I think 13 channels and it had like this little wooden box and you have to go and like press the little button and it would change the, to one of the 13 channels you got, including your, your big broadcast channels. And then eventually it's, you know, a clicker, et cetera. But um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> the Atlantic divide. Yeah, no, no. And, and but, but you're right. I don't, I like, I, I was realizing um, my wife has been watching Hulu lately because I subscribe to the, I subscribe to Hulu, I subscribe to Amazon Prime, and I subscribe to, to Netflix. Um, and I don't watch, I mean, when you spend your life listening to fascist talk all the time, you don't have a lot of time for television. Um, <laughs> it's probably it's, better, to be honest. <laughs> you know, it's, um, but, uh, but like, and I, I actually pay for, uh, pay for YouTube. Um, and the reason I do that is just so I can turn my, my phone off and listen to YouTube videos on my phone without mm -hmm. the screen having to be on and i little like I, I it seems like such a like but that means that i never see youtube ads so people complain about youtube ads and i i haven't seen a youtube ad in years at this point because do i you, just do you just them. not get do you just not get the ads then if you i pay? just don't get the ads if you pay for it oh, you don't get I, the might, ads, you know? I might have to think about doing this myself because i yeah yeah, yeah you, you can you can you can listen to the the soundtrack without having to have the phone on and you don't get the ads this is right. sounding pretty good yeah. i mean they're they're literally i mean they literally just like they, they, they made this feature yes yeah, so I'm, I'm shilling they, for youtube they everybody literally they literally <laughs> made the feature to where like you can't turn the phone off yeah. and just listen to it unless we pay unless you pay it yeah solely to get people to be like that's how annoying it is it is, it is literally I have I have done YouTube's bidding by giving them yeah. money for yeah. this feature, but Fastest. at the time at the time uh, Nick Fuentes was still on uh, YouTube, and I had to listen to his show for two hours a day. And uh, <laughs> oh, you know, salad days. Yeah, the only the only way to do that was to either set the phone somewhere where you could, like, if I was doing dishes or something, you'd set the phone and mm -hmm. just sort of like hope you didn't knock it off, or you'd have to very gingerly like put it in my pocket and kind of like just not move around too much. Or else I would like click something and then it would yes, change, you know. Yes, yep. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I I very specifically bought one of those phone cases that's got a cover. Oh, so nice. I can nice. so I can have the phone in my pocket and have YouTube on and it won't constantly be uh be pressing button pressing the screen by itself. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, this yeah, is so, old men navigate technology. This is what this yes. uh podcast episode has devolved into or evolved into. Yeah. Uh, depending and, on <laughs> how you feel beg, about that. beg YouTube for, for sponsorship money. <laughs> right. Uh, but like, no, what I was saying is like, I don't see ads like ever anymore. And so then I was no. sitting and I was watching uh, Bob's Burgers with my wife and suddenly there are ads and I'm like, oh, this is what ads look like. And then, you know, um, they look the same. They, 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 they haven't changed. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, no, I think they're worse. I think um, they're, I don't know. This may just be me being an old man again, you know, but this mm -hmm. is a running theme of this one, obviously. But I feel I've had very much the same experience because, as I say, I used to buy satellite television and I stopped and I really don't watch television anymore. I mean, I do. I watch a lot of television, but I uh, acquire it through the internet acquire it in, yeah. in, in entirely legal means of course sure. yeah um in every case never in any other than illegal uh, manner yeah. but um yeah i i watch television but i don't watch television if you know what i mean yeah. so i've completely gotten out of the habit of putting up with adverts um because you know 
I don't know. It's our culture, isn't it? I mean, Charlie Brooker once said that it's a bit like the lead in the pipes that used to get into the water and drove the Romans insane. Television is like that for us. Or was it him relaying Kurt Vonnegut? I think it was, actually. But um, it's just so much a part of our culture that, uh, you know, the TV just burbles on all the time and you get used to adverts. As well. I mean, TV is bad enough, but adverts. And it's like you, you stop you stop seeing them for a little while and then for one reason or another you start seeing them again you know and it's astounding to be i mean i'm kind of horrified by the idea that this absolute toxic sludge was just being poured into my head for years you know particularly yeah. in in my vulnerable years. when we were children it's no, horrifying exactly. yeah no yeah no yeah exactly it's horrifying that well, we have the... an entire culture <laughs> set up around just just funneling this absolute fucking garbage porridge into people's <laughs> brains. I I think I think maybe the like the the sort of like the like the Hulu ads because you know I, I don't know I think it's like you get like two for every like fifteen minutes of of television or something like that and it's only like thirty yeah. seconds it's, it's like a minute at a time and it just doesn't feel but like in the U S and maybe I know it's different I know it's different over there but in the U S. Like if we had cable for a while, I mean, we had cable for quite a while. Um, and then eventually it just got to be, we were spending way too much money on cable. Like it just got, yeah. like we got a deal and they they, get, they lock you into the two-year contract. And so you're paying like this kind of discounted rate. And then eventually you just kind of get used to having it. And then suddenly you're paying the full rate and uh, you just kind of stick on it because, well, now we're actually kind of watching it, <laughs> you know, then I just kind of realized, um, you know, for the like three shows that we actually watch, I could, you know, we could just buy those, <laughs> you know, yeah. like these days you, yeah. you literally can just go and like buy them, you know, on, on Amazon or whatever, and just have them um, instead yeah. of having to, to, to pay them the monthly fee. Um, so, um, yeah. but yeah, no, yeah, in I... the U S in the U S like commercials are, you know, you spend, seven minutes watching television and then three minutes watching commercials and then seven minutes watching oh, yeah. television and then three minutes watching commercials. And that's it's just not... like, that felt like much more like Chinese water torture to me of yeah. like, you know, where just, you just feel it. And it's the same three ads over and over and over again. Oh too. God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's very, it's very similar now navigating YouTube because everything's got fucking ad, ads all over it on YouTube. Yeah, it, it's worth it's the, I don't, I'm not even sure. I think it's like 11. I think I, I share one with my wife. So neither one of us, like you can do the family thing and do it for multiple accounts. Um, and I don't know exactly how much that costs because it just comes out of my direct deposit and whatever it is, it's like $10 or something. And it was absolutely like, now I never get to see a YouTube ad. <laughs> so it's, it's been freedom. It's been helpful. Yeah. For sure. No, this sounds good. This sounds good. Um, no, it, I don't think it's quite. I don't think the advert to content ratio is on British television is quite that bad yet, but it's certainly getting there. Um, it's certainly much worse than it used to be. Again, old man, I remember being a kid. You know, you'd watch a movie, you'd watch You Only Live Twice or whatever, and um, on ITV, and there'd be three or four ad breaks in it over the course of a two-hour movie. You sure. know, these these days. That sounds like I, heaven. Like, God know, knows. You know, like God knows. No, the beauty, the, the beauty, there was actually a, uh, there was a basic cable channel. I mean, there still is a TBS, uh, Turner Broadcasting System or whatever, um, mm -hmm. which would air its, uh, its programming was always, instead of at the hour and a half hour mark, it was always at 35 and 05. So you would start it at 7.35 instead of 7.30. And yeah. the thing that that meant that you could tune into that channel while the ads were playing on the other channel you were watching and watch whatever stupid Saved by the Bell rerun or whatever was playing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I don't, I don't so have to scared. watch the damn ads anymore. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, man. The thing is like, I'm li literally sitting here and we're talking about this because we're old men, you know, we're in our forties at this point. <laughs> and I'm just thinking about like our 22 year olds listening to this podcast and like have no context, you know, <laughs> like there was this uh, bit on the, uh, on the, on the uh, podcast, Mike Dicta, where, um, you know, because that was a, that was a show for, for lawyers and they would uh, left, left-leaning lawyers. And they would, um, you know, they ranged in ages from like 50 to like 25, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, at one point, you know, uh, the Charles Starr was uh, joking about something. And uh, one of the young ladies who was on the show was just like, oh, are you going to tell us about like your old man stuff? Tell us about calling a taxi, dad, you know? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> 
<laughs> I feel very much. I feel very, I feel very, um, you know, the, we've just, we've just hit that, hit that part in our, uh, in our lives at this point. Um, Cause hey, I do actually look. work with a lot of younger people. And I mean, it really is there are things that they talk about and I'm just like, my experience of this world has been so much different than yours <laughs> um, <laughs> in ways uh, good and bad, you know, like, you know, it's, yeah. it's a thing. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, um, I think this is kind of, I mean, I've noticed we've been talking for a while now. We haven't really even started talking about the film, but this I mean, is maybe, kind maybe of, this is our podcast. I mean, honestly, this is a bonus episode. Let's just move. We can do in the loop anytime. It's fine. We, we just do what we like, you know, yeah. fuck it. This is for the paying customers. We can give them whatever we want. <laughs> exactly. Um, I've got that the right way around. Haven't I? Um, <laughs> yeah, no. This is kind of accidentally relevant, though, isn't it? Right. Because this sort of old men reminisce about things that a lot of young people listening, and we do have strangely young listenership, which is great, actually. Um, <laughs> a lot of young people listening will be going, what the fuck are these two old gits talking about? <laughs> like, I, I think it's kind of accidentally relevant because this is that is now a description of the Iraq invasion. That is yeah. the, the Iraq war. That That is, it is a historical event. It's, it's an old thing in the dis, you know, there are people sentient now who weren't even fucking born, you know? Right. You know what I mean? It's like, well, it, well it, I mean, you know, the, 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 Iraq the, war, same... the Iraq war started in 2003 and this yeah. was 2009. And yeah. even then in the loop felt like it was, you know, I saw it, probably a year or two after its release. I don't know, probably something like 2011 or something like that. But um, because I, I actually, again, a bygone era, I, I actually rented the disc from Netflix. That was how I got the, uh, that was how I saw this <laughs> time. Um, but yeah, no, like this is a, a film that uh, even at the time kind of felt like it was a little bit past its like relevance yeah. in a way yeah. you know and it's it feels because it's released by bbc films and it does feel a bit like the bbc cut i mean I, if you know about the ructions between the bbc and the government at the time of the invasion with alistair right. campbell and all that stuff it does feel a bit like the bbc you know ages after the arguments finished the bbc suddenly going and another thing that's <laughs> <laughs> like to me. That's it. I yeah no I I don't I don't know that story, but that does uh, that does add a that does add a shade onto it, right? You know, um, yeah but no. no I, was, I, I was just I, thinking because you know for a lot of people now who are politically aware and politically active, um, the the invasion of Iraq, you know that that must feel to them the same way or something like the same way that uh, like the Vietnam War or. Uh, or the JFK assassination or Watergate or something felt to me when I was a young person becoming politically aware, you know, it's, it's this thing that happened way back when, you know, and right. it's significant, but it still feels like something from the before times. Well, I mean, fuck it. It's 2021. <laughs> Everything feels like it's from the before times, doesn't it? Really? <laughs> right. Yeah. I feel like even like the pre-COVID era feels like prehistoric. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Like it's times February point, twenty, you know? February last year feels like the you know the the first age of Middle Earth or whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Which is also something that kind of happened after nine eleven is that you know like nine eleven becomes this like moment in history, and there's like a before and an after, and you know within weeks suddenly you know whatever we were talking about on september 10th just felt like this complete other reality and like i feel like yeah. like march 2020 definitely has that kind of impression to it that everything that we were talking about before then just it, it had like i look at like news articles and, and like opinion pieces particularly those that are like in february you know like like just as the thing was kind of starting but before we really hit the the moment of truth on it and yeah. it does feel like there's this just like back, back when reality. everybody was thinking well it'll be like SARS it won't really affect us so who, who gives a shit right well and I feel like god you know the thing with uh, god the thing with the thing for me is like always whenever these kinds of things and this this actually might be relevant whenever like uh, you know when SARS was a thing or when um the Ebola pandemic uh, you know kind of the mm -hmm. Ebola virus thing in, in late in Barack Obama's term um hey re remember when people were angry about how the Obama administration handled that <laughs> right <laughs> remember when they when they was when they were criticized for not handling that very well uh, yeah remember <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I feel I feel like there's this uh, there's this thing in which I feel like the you know like the the Washington Post and the New York Times and you know every website puts out the put up the like the big coronavirus and like kind of big like with the the like the you know the the big scary graphics and the, and yeah. the you know, kind of like you know we're gonna highlight coronavirus is this giant thing that's happening and at that point you know it was you know. A handful of people, not a handful. I don't want to. I don't want to diminish it, but it was this kind of far off thing in China, and we have this experience of, or you know, look, there are medical professionals, there are you know professional people who are paid to do this. We put a lot of money into you know nominally taking care of these things. The Chinese government is just going to crack down and beat some people's heads in, but they're going to control this thing, right? And so, like it all. Oh, you. You capitalist shill, Daniel. Honestly. Well, I, I'm not. I'm not saying that's How a good you? thing. I'm How dare saying. you criticize the People's Republic of China? I'm you just imperialist saying. American. I'm just saying it's just the reality of like you know like it always like very early on. I really felt like look this is going to kind of blow over to a certain degree, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it really was not, I really didn't take it as this like life changing event because I trusted yeah. that there were, and not even, not even like a, like a kind of naive way or not in, just like, look, there are systems in place that are basically going to take care of this one way or the other. Mm-hmm. And um, it's never going to be something that's going to be, you know, hugely influential in my life because I live in the seat of empire and I don't have to deal with these things. It's just the reality of like being an American means someone else is going to take care of this. And fundamentally (laughs) that was very mistaken. That was a very mistaken impression. Although uh, that was built on, you know, just kind of the experience of being a working adult (laughs) in America in the 21st century. Um, And I feel like the, the, the other, I mean, again, to kind of come back to the movie a little bit in the the context, um, you know, that's a lot of what's kind of going on in, in the Iraq war, because I was in my early twenties at that point. And I was just like, surely we are not this dumb. Like there is no, like everybody knows like Afghanistan was one thing like that. I thought that was like warmongering and, and I, you know, I hated George W. Bush for going into Afghanistan, but at least I sort of got, okay, we're, we're there because, we need to topple the Taliban because Osama bin Laden's a bad guy. And like, this is, I mean, at least that's sort of like, there, there's a sort of reciprocation there. Like that's sort it, of like, it, there's a logic yeah. to it. Right. It, but then it had like, a certain superficial plausibility, you know, right, right. it wasn't and immediately. Again, ridiculous. I'm not justifying yeah. the war in Afghanistan. No. I'm just saying no. like, there is a certain like relentless logic to that, to that occurrence. The yeah. idea that the, we, we would then go, how about Iraq? How about our, mm, Iraq? We need to we need to maybe bomb that place as well. And there was like no, I mean, obviously, I think anyone listening to this will will know there was no justification for it ever. <laughs> you know, it just wasn't. No. Um, but it felt like to be to be mercilessly clear about this, and I'm, I know you agree with me. None for the invasion of Afghanistan either. Right. But absolutely. The point absolutely. I think we were we were both trying to make was that you know the the invasion of Afghanistan as co- totally unjustifiable as it as it was um it had a kind of aesthetic logic that you can understand why some people kind of looked at it and went uh, yeah, okay but iraq just never did did it, it right right it, it was just and, obviously complete well you rubbish. know with with afghanistan you could kind of feel like i'm not making this decision like even at like even in my 20s i was sort of thinking like i could see like special forces units kind of going in and like specifically going after whatever taliban encampment there was going to be or whatever but the war made no sense to me right yeah like even yeah. even in that kind of like liberal haze of 2003 right um but iraq which it just felt like not only was it completely um nonsensical not only was it like just kind of just kind of batty but uh it felt like everyone with any degree of sense agreed that it made no sense and yet it was happening anyway right yeah exactly like yeah. like it was just like the, even the arguments in favor of the war in iraq were you know <laughs> like they, they they were just kind of like facially bad 
um, on every level if you paid yeah. attention to it for a second. Exactly. Um, it didn't even have that momentary, superficial aesthetic logic that Afghanistan had if you squinted at it. It was just patently cynical and and a bunch of bullshit just from the start. Right. And it, this, is the, this is the thing. I mean, it, it should have warned us. It should have told us where we were headed because – we all knew, basically everybody knew. I mean, I remember at the time feeling that even the people, do, I mean, you've kind of said this, but I felt at the time, even the people defending it knew, you know, they, they, their arguments were so transparently atrocious. And you, you looked at them sometimes and you, I mean, I just, not, not Tony Blair, weirdly enough, because I think Tony Blair was, the, the thing about Tony Tony Blair and people like him are weird because I, I just I don't think believe and sincere and and stuff like that mean the same thing to creatures like that that they mean to the rest of us but I didn't get the th when I looked at Tony Blair I didn't feel like he knew what he was saying was bullshit I didn't feel like he was lying as such um but a lot of the people defending the war I just I just did I'd look at them and I was thinking you know this is crap you know perfectly well what you're doing and it's like as you say it's like everybody knew and it didn't make any difference it 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 happened anyway despite almost everybody knowing that it was an utterly cynical move and that it, the, the the reasons and justifications had been cooked up you know and it should have it, I feel like it should have warned us <laughs> for where we were going <laughs> right because that's where we are now you know it, it things just don't matter things are apparently not true or apparently insane or apparently obscene just apparent to the eye and everybody just goes yeah that's terrible and then nothing happened right because the people who you know recognize those things and who are actually affected by them are not the ones who have the ability to actually make change in the world uh, unfortunately yeah, and I feel like I mean that's the that is the the basic material root of the problem, but I feel like it's being exacerbated in our culture by the fact that we now live in this uh oh god, I'm gonna sound like such an old fart. I'm not doing a oh bloody it's social media's fault. I'm not doing that. But there is something about the the information world we live in now and the way politics is mediated through this constant flow of information across corporate social media sites that just exacerbates this problem, I think. Well, this uh, this gets I mean, again just to just to touch on the movie again. I mean, I think uh, you know part of the to briefly touch on the movie we're supposed <laughs> to be talking about. Part of part of the issue. I mean, I think part of what the the movie seeds at is you know and sort of I, I know you were tweeting about it, and so I think we can. I think there's a conversation. Yeah, I don't like that, this movie. That's okay. upfront about it. Uh, I actually, I actually, I mean, I quite liked it um, when I saw it the first time, and I have liked it upon rewatching. Um, mm -hmm. I definitely see your criticisms, and I liked it much less upon this uh, rewatch. Although I do, I do think there are things to enjoy about it. So um, I spoil know. everything, Daniel. It's no, 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 fine. it's, it's, it's fine. It's fine. You know, part of part of part of, <laughs> part of you know part of you know being on a podcast and talking about these things is to engage with a more critical. <laughs> lens right you know but i think you know one of the things you kind of like put your finger on in in your in your uh, minor tweet thread was um that the movie kind of like makes them makes these people into just kind of like the reason they do bad things is because they're just ordinary people and ordinary people just kind of fuck up sometimes and there's actually a kind of a larger ideological agenda at work um in these things if i'm if i'm not uh mis summarizing you or you know um no no that's about right yeah yeah um and what I what I see is watching this movie, <laughs> um, seeing the kind of like the sheer, just the, the 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 kind of the human fuck ups, the kind of human collateral that's just kind of happening, and just the kind of you know the the just the interpersonal conflicts that are kind of built on nothing, and just kind of the 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 blokiness of it, I guess. Um, the thing mm -hmm. that like strikes me about that is that now all of our politicians and like leaders and journalists are all on Twitter all the time. And we see what dipshits they actually are now. <laughs> Whereas in yeah. another era, there was a little bit more of a, there was, there was kind of a barrier between, you know, us and, and that realization. And I feel like that's something that feels very true to me, you know, um, in the film is that like, without, without necessarily going all the way and saying like, well, this is what really what it is, but like Matt Iglesias Twitter 
is just as ridiculous as anything that happens <laughs> in this film, right? You know, like and and like he's he's encouraged to act that way by the Twitter engagement to, to a certain degree. I mean, and you know, seeing seeing just how openly venal they are and how like how their personality conflicts really do just come come to like create huge swaths of our uh political reality and seeing them, you know, just seeing them for what they are through their Twitter feed um, really does like it, it really, I mean, the, the film does feel slightly prescient in that way to be at least, at least in terms of that, that kind of minor uh, thing. So um, you can, you can roast me now if you like. No, I, I, I agree actually. I mean, my, my thread, my thread for people that haven't read it and you know, <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? Not hanging on my every Twitter utterance, my God. Um, <laughs> if you haven't read what I said, but it boils down to this, I think, um, the the movie kind of alibis politicians uh with its picture of the of the political process as being dominated by kind of random human folly you know the the politicians and the movers and shakers are depicted as foolish people selfish people uh, petty people clumsy clueless befuddled etc and that it's like um, the movie is saying that that's that is why these things happen. The, the movie almost depicts the invasion of of the because it's never named. It's never actually right. Iraq or anything specific in the movie because it's satirical and uh, and non specific. But it kind of it it depicts the whole thing as like this just concatenation of mistakes and crossed wires and people just doing things because it's their job or because they they're ambitious for for position and power and and uh, public recognition or because they just they they just um they, they, people are people are working on autopilot and and trying to make themselves look as good as they can in any given situation and falling over their own shoes and so it's very it's very comedic and i think there is a degree of truth to that. I mean, you, you're absolutely right. Twitter has allowed us to to an extent that wasn't really, again, the before times, 2009. This was uh, <laughs> right. BT before Twitter. Um, Twitter, before Twitter, Twitter, Twitter really existed. Its... Twitter existed, but it was not what it is now. Right? Yeah, it existed, and I joined Twitter a year after that. 2010 is when I joined Twitter. <laughs> God help me. But it wasn't <laughs> what it is now. We, you know, it hasn't it hadn't had the cultural effect then that it has now. Um, and yeah, that cultural effect has been one of the cultural effects of Twitter has been to show us that these people are to many of them anyway, to a huge extent, just a bunch of clueless, clumsy idiots. In- incredibly to, to that extent, um, falling over their own shoes constantly. But I that is definitely part of the truth. I just worry that the movie leaves out so much i suppose and yeah, I, I i actually i agree with that and, and let me let me let me just uh i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna push slightly on that and 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 mm-hmm. that a little bit and say we don't actually meet any people of actual power in this movie well it depends who you think linton bar that's a brilliant name by the way linton right? barwick that, <laughs> that is a wonderful <laughs> piss take american name that but feels very pensionian to me right <laughs> yeah. it depends who you think he is like i mean who do you think linton barwick is supposed to be roughly i know he's not meant to be specifically any one person but right roughly you know who who is he an analog to well i mean he would be i mean he's according to wikipedia he is the u.s assistant secretary of state for policy so he's essentially sort of like working for uh uh god who was secretary of state in 2000 i mean he's essentially working for um um john Kerry, i guess in like 2015 would sort of be that uh that are uh working for hillary clinton uh, around this time would have been because i think she was secretary of state and at the time this movie was released um so he would be sort of like second tier version of that god who was secretary of state in george w Bush's I'm, White I'm, House? I'm looking it up i'm looking it up oh it's colin powell okay so well and that's god that's even so more if, interesting if condoleezza right? rice was the under secretary of state right so he's so he's sort of the you know white no, 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 sorry hang on hang, hang right. on a minute Condoleezza Rice served as United States Secretary of State under George W. Bush, preceded by Colin Powell and followed by Hillary Clinton. So right. she, he's either meant to be Powell or Rice. 
Well, no, he's the assistant to the secretary. He's the assistant to. So yeah. he's he's kind of like what we're seeing are these kind of like undersecretaries is kind of the point that I'm making. We're not seeing kind of like the major politicians. And also, I would say right. that like Linton Barwick is is actually one of the more powerful people, uh, certainly in the film, and someone who is much more. Um, ideologically motivated and certain like he's not a bumbling fool like he's the one like giving people the business so like well yeah you know the creepy omen child is kind of like hanging around him for career obligations and wanting to go play squash or whatever and you know like sucking his toes <laughs> you know um barwick is certainly not like he 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 has an agenda like he has a cl- very clear agenda we are going to war and he is using the yeah. kind of losers around him to make that happen um uh, peter capaldi's malcolm tucker uh is like working directly for the the prime minister and the prime minister has laid down the law we are going to fucking war and it's your job to execute that and malcolm tucker you know he has his his kind of fuck ups from from time to time but he is very fully motivated and on the team of like pushing team war on this, you know, like there's no, there's no question there. So I feel like there is, there is, you do get the sense of sort of the larger, that there is this kind of larger like climate that is happening, that we are going to do this because the people who are actually in charge are going to make it happen. Um, But uh, what we're seeing is the way that the sort of uh, that intersects with sort of the foibles of people's actual lives. And in this sort of like comedic, um, um, you know, almost sitcom level uh, uh, reality, right? Like, so I don't know. I feel I, I see your point, but I think there is a little bit more to it than that, right? Yeah, I, I think you're right. Actually, on reflection, I think what the movie is doing is it kind of it's kind of leaving the the ultimate cause of the events, the 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 motivation, um, in a kind of black box at the center, isn't it? And Barwick is one of the few people in the movie who's kind of been in the black box and come out again to do the, uh, you know, he's, he's been in the room with the Vulcans, so to speak, um, that, that coterie around George Bush who were pushing for the war. Um, and, and, and Tucker as well. Uh, he's, he's been in that, in that space, that space that we don't see. Yeah. So you can, you can look upon it as uh, just leaving that out leaving out the 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 core uh, of um ideological and you know imperialist strategic commitment and showing us everything going on around it with with only a couple of people who've who've been in there and heard those conversations and and aren't sharing them with anybody i suppose yeah i mean i see it i see it more as like the, the that like it's almost i don't know maybe you could say this is it's too clever for trying to do this but i feel like it's more about the uh kind of the experience of sort of being within this system and living within it and you know ultimately you know kind of having your i mean these people are careerists i mean you know this is this you know literally you Mm. know what we see over and over again in the film i mean you know the first thing that uh creepy omen child says to uh to liza weld is like you could not be that paper could not have been more against the policy agenda of this government if you tried and i think you did try right um uh, you know, they're, they're, like everybody knows there are certain things that you say and certain things that you do for what, while the people, uh, you know, for, for the administration, that they have their goals. And ultimately, it's your job to toe the line and to produce the documents that they want. And if you're not doing that, then you're a problem. Right. Um, yeah. And I mean, I think we see that kind of kind of over and over again is that, that and, and that you don't need the uh the like, no one that you don't need everyone involved in the system to be this sort of like bluntly ideological you know sort of malevolent force in order to create horrifying wars you know um no and i, I yeah there there is a there is a value in showing that and and how, i mean um atro- atrocities government atrocities horrific crimes uh, including the very worst in history uh happen and can happen because a huge number of people just show up at the office and do their job day to day uh you know the 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 worst crimes in history were reliant to a huge extent upon people whose job was to you know 
plan train schedules and that's all they did and they did it because they wanted to get on and impress the boss and get a paycheck and stuff like that and yeah sure the the the, there is an awful lot of just um petty human venality and ambition and and just um just just short-sighted selfish careerism that goes into every system that's fine um but I feel like, you know, the, the choice to show us that, I suppose that has a value to, to show you that these, these things happen uh, as a result of systems running that way, just through people being uh, not actively malevolent and not even ideological, but just, uh, just doing their job, so to speak. Uh, I suppose that does have a value. But I feel like the fact that it leaves, it leaves that black box there and it does, and it right. uh, it just it's 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 always going to run the risk of you know people not noticing, people not noticing the black box and taking the the part for the whole. I think, and I think where where we do run into problems is with the is with the character of Malcolm Tucker, the the Peter Capaldi character, and I mean, the statement Malcolm Tucker is based on Alistair Campbell is a controversial one various people have claimed that and denied it and etc cetera, etc cetera. but i it, it, alistair campbell is the closest analog there's sure there's just no doubt about that um although i don't think alistair campbell actually really behaved the way malcolm tucker does um but <laughs> is it he, he, hold on, he, I, is, is it like a meme over there that like scottish people are routinely that horrifying to everyone around them well, no, no, not really. Not that I'm aware of. No. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, go uh, you, Alistair, Campbell, Alistair Campbell. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Alistair Campbell was known as being, you know, Tony Blair's fixer, hatchet man, get it done guy, you know. Um, and Alistair Campbell was, I mean, I you said you didn't know about this, but it's a it's a it's a big thing in this country. Um about the uh, the dossiers, you know, that British intelligence. Uh, British government supplied to the Americans uh, intel that, that Britain supplied to the Americans that was used very prominently by the by the American government to uh, justify the right. invasion I, of Iraq. I, I remembered that after you said it. I mean, it is one of those things where all this just kind of disappears into like kind of yeah. brain fog. But right, I mean, the, like the the yellow cake uranium stuff was all uh, British yeah. intelligence, right? Yeah, and Mohammed Atta traveling to right. meet representative of Saddam's. Yeah, da, 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 da. right. Yeah, exactly, um, exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you, God, I knew so much about all this back in the day. You know, at <laughs> right. the time, I yeah. would have been able to rattle this off in detail. I had so many fucking books about all this, and uh, yeah, I was just, I was reading all the magazines, all the left wing magazines, which just, you know, I could have, I could have gone into details about all this, but that now it really has faded. <laughs> <laughs> right it's no i terrible. read i read a bunch of those books too and i used to like follow the news every day and every you know all the all the you know every atrocity that uh that was being committed in my name etc cetera, etc cetera. and then you know at a certain yeah. point it does i mean at a certain, like and i and this isn't good right this isn't like a good thing that i'm about to say but at a certain point you just stop right like yeah at a certain point it just becomes well we're there um yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, and again, this does not speak well for me and I'm not like, I'm not justifying this, but I will absolutely admit to the fact that in 2008, you know, Barack Obama came into office and suddenly I'm like, well, I don't have to think too hard about that anymore. Yep. That's what happened. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's why, I, you know, that's lib, lib brain for you. Right. Um, you know, but that's well, for- I think it's just, it, it's very human. It, it, right. It, it, it's very human. Um, but um, yeah, what was I saying? Yeah, the, there's the British government via British intelligence services uh, supplied lots of intelligence, quote unquote intelligence, about supposed links between uh, Iraq, the Iraqi regime and uh, bin Laden, 9-11 and Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, Saddam's uh, intentions and capabilities to have uh, weapons of mass destruction and deploy them terroristically and in war, et cetera, and attack his neighbors and so on and so forth. And it was all, it would I mean to, to be very technical and use the terms that we would, you know, academics would use in political science. It was all bollocks. Um, <laughs> yes. But it was, it, it was personified. 
that is personified in the British imagination to the extent that anybody fucking remembers any of this um, in the phrase dodgy dossier. Um, and I think, I think, um, God, there were actually two dossiers. And the one that was called the dodgy dossier, I think, was the first one, which had a section that was actually just plagiarized verbatim from somebody's an undergraduate thesis or something, um, which is this, just, this is all that coming is back actually, to me now. This is all coming back to me yeah. now. Yes. <laughs> That is directly parodied in this movie. Yep. Um, and then the second dossier is the one that contained the uh, Saddam can deploy weapons of mass destruction in 45 minutes claim, um, right. which was uh, the one which led to the suicide of Dr. David Kelly. David right. Kelly was like the foremost weapons inspector um, in the world. And, uh, you know, in, he had he was responsible for finding Saddam's WMD program when Saddam did in fact have one. Um, and David Kelly briefed a uh, BBC journalist, Andrew Gilligan about, I mean, it's disputed. It's disputed what he said, and you can't really believe much Andrew Gilligan says, um, but it is, he, he had a conversation with Andrew Gilligan, which led Andrew Gilligan to say on the BBC that the BB, um, that the government, included information in the second dossier, I believe it was the second dossier, which they knew to be based on bad intel. And this uh, this dossier, which came from the, the JIC, the Joint Intelligence Committee, via, I think, several other agencies, uh, via the government, um, Alistair Campbell, who was Tony Blair's chief of staff or something or other, um, he just went absolutely fucking bonkers about this. Um, you know, it's incredibly mild, to be honest with you. It's an incredibly mild claim, but at the time it was dynamite. And it led to this gigantic feud between the government and the BBC. And the BBC, I mean, in 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 all fairness, the BBC did very badly. They, the, the report is bad. It's not well sourced. David Kelly's remarks were probably misrepresented, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then Andrew Gilligan goes to save his own skin in the midst of all this. He goes and reveals his source, um, which the government did as well, actually. Everybody, the government uh, and Andrew Gilligan both basically revealed to the to the press that David Kelly was the source of, of this of this claim um, to the extent that he was throwing him completely under the bus for their own, uh, you know, mutual um but but opposed selfish purposes which led to him thinking because he was asked to testify to a committee or something and in fear of losing his career he told a, a very white lie under enormous pressure about whether or not he'd spoken to another journalist and this led the poor man to to have such a crisis thinking he'd lost his career that he that he committed suicide and so it it, it was a huge thing it was a huge deal in britain right um, and what I was what I was getting around to is that Malcolm Tucker in the movie and in the indeed in the TV series in the thick of it, the nearest analog in the real world to him is Alistair Campbell. And the interesting thing is that Alistair Campbell, I think, was a true believer. I really do. I, I don't think Alistair Campbell thought he was lying. I don't think Alistair Campbell thought of himself as just this cynical political operator whose job is to sort of be the prime minister's blunt instrument and just kick ass until he gets it done. I think Alistair Campbell was, and, and again, I was talking about Tony Blair. I think for, for people like that, words like believe and sincere, et cetera, they mean something different, but I think to the extent that they can be, these people are sincere. They And when it comes down to, it ultimately does come down to material interests. You know, it, it, right. in my opinion, the, the invasion of Iraq ultimately comes down to imperialism, the logic of imperialism. But the people doing it aren't conscious of that. They're not thinking, right, we shall go to work today and further the interests of capitalist imperialism. They think they're doing all sorts of other things. Um, because, well, I mean, in the in the U.S., the, the, the project for a new American century, the PNAC crowd, the, the neoconservatives. Yeah very clearly ideologically motivated in terms of you know they didn't believe that iraq had weapons of mass destruction i mean whether they did or didn't is, is kind of immaterial they, they the, the point was we're using this as an excuse to go in and and kind of exert uh american power through geopolitics we want to you know they, 
take yeah. this region of the world and then we're going to mouth up some some fine words about democracy and freedom etc cetera, etc cetera, and you know point to you know beheadings which are all obviously terrible <laughs> we're not standing for you know <laughs> for uh, what became the islamic state or you know the taliban or anything like that but you know they, they 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 point to kind of terrible barbarities that are happening in certain places of the world and uh, then use that to justify like cluster bombing those people and all the people who are victims of those people etc cetera, etc cetera, you know yeah. like there's a very clear kind of ideological through line there which was not even hidden i mean you know like i don't think we have to bend over backwards and you know kind of you know say you know well they were they were saying one thing or they believed one thing i mean they were they're pretty obviously actors on this stage who were intentionally spouting bullshit right yeah um they they may not have believed that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and, and they didn't believe that Iraq was involved in 9-11. They knew that was crap, but they believed that what they were doing was right. You know, right. they 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 believed that um uh taking Iraq via American power, projecting American power across the world, um and then you know basically uh violently privatizing the Iraqi economy and, and selling it off to uh, for, for on the cheap to uh, Western companies and, and controlling the oil, etc. They they believed that was the right thing to do. They believed ideologically that it was the right thing to do because these were people who were convinced of the rightness of American power and right. and the, the 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 correctness of uh, the domination of the globe by American uh, economic and military power. These were, in that sense, idealists. And I well, think that, that is something. that is a very chilling truth that I think doesn't find any place in the worldview that, that In the Loop represents. I think I, 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 de I definitely I hear you on that. I definitely I definitely get that. I, I, I agree. Um, you know, I was just um, actually happened to be rereading this bit in Current Affairs from Nathan Robinson. I know everybody hates Nathan Robinson. I hate Nathan Robinson about 35 percent of the time as well. It's fine. I anyway. He was writing about uh, Matt. I, the, 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 the poor guy should probably just change his name to, you know, uh, I, I don't like Nathan Robinson. <laughs> right. Like, I think current affairs is a fine, you know, is a fine product. Like if you're going to kind of get your social democracy somewhere, then current affairs is a fine place to get it. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. I have um, no problem with it. Like, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I'm not one of these people that refuses for ideological reasons to read Jacobin, you know, it's fine. Jacobin right. published good articles. Yeah. I would probably, I would probably rather read current affairs than Jacobin at this point. Uh, but you know, that's <laughs> with no disrespect to, you know, I actually know people who've written for well, Jacobin, Tribune, so, then, Tribune. Know? We'll make it Tribune. <laughs> okay, whatever. Anyway, I was reading um, the piece that uh, Nathan Robinson wrote about Matthew Iglesias's um, uh, most recent, I guess it's his first, I don't know, do you have a previous book? Anyway, his, his book, One Billion Americans, which is very openly saying, well, we all agree that America, that America should be the unquestioned superpower of the world. And the only way we're going to do that is by building up our economy. And the only way we do that is by building up the number of people in the country. And so we need to just open up immigration and just allow um, and bring in 600 million more people so that we can compete with the um uh, the power, the, the kind of population powerhouses of uh, India and China, or else we're going to be kind of left behind uh, as they sort of like take their place in the world stage in the in the coming century. Um, now, a, I actually agree that an open borders policy is good. Yes, congratulations. One point of agreement between me and Iggy there. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> the logic, the logic, <laughs> just the unquestioned assumption that, uh, well, of course. America should just be the unquestioned superpower of the world. Like we have to maintain our dominance because, well, we're the good people you see, as opposed to those like yeah. other people, you know, who believe in different kinds of things and who don't, you know, like, like that basic logic, like that's, that's kind of what's going on in the, in the war in Iraq. Right. That's kind of what's happening there is like, yes, whether they have weapons of mass destruction or not, the world is a better place if America exerts its position in the world stage, right? And yeah. therefore, yeah. if it's, we go in... It's the, it's, it's the cops framing the guy because they genuinely believe he's guilty. That's right. And if we kill a few, you know, look, this is how empires are made. This is how we, this is how this world works. It's, it's a, like, a, like a, a realist, you know, political realist position is to just say, look, 
people die because this is an empire we got here. And if we're going to um, make the world a better place and, you know, make the world safe for the American way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is just something that just kind of has to happen and we'll hand ring about it and we'll feel bad about it. And we'll put out, you know, humanitarian aid here and there, but ultimately the world is a better place because we did this and that's just it, you know, and that's, and that's a logic you can get a whole lot of liberals behind as well, just to be clear here. Right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Because I mean, and, and if you remember, I mean, it's certainly in the U S the main objections to uh, going to war in Iraq was like, well, <laughs> You know, we need to do this with international, uh, you know, accord. We need to do this as a, you know, the UN should be the one directing the troops. <laughs> you know, that's a, like there was never, yeah. there, there, there's very rarely a, um, you know, a kind of principled, well, actually, no, like murdering a whole bunch of brown people in the Middle East is bad. And actually, we've been doing that for a long time. And we should also stop doing all of that stuff. Um, and into this void, just to kind of make it slightly more relevant to the IDSG kind of remit, uh, into this void actually stepped a whole lot of um, uh, paleocons and a whole lot of people who kind of adjacent to or right along the edge of white nationalism in 2003-2004. There are a ton of people like Mike Enoch personally says he got into this kind of politics. He got into white nationalist politics in part because the only people who were actually making a principled stand against the Iraq war were the white nationalists and the paleocons. Of course, their version was the, as we've said in other places, uh, we should put a border, we should militarize like the u.s border as opposed to kind of going off and fighting wars uh for israel or wars for zog etc 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 but um <laughs> there's at least you know that 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 it, when the left is not able to kind of or not visibly able to make the the principled case when what you get is this kind of liberal hand wringing um into that vacuum steps uh the worst people imaginable yeah absolutely um i think i think we should at least mention um james gandolfini whom um, I, this is when, when he died, this was the movie I watched to remember him, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think we should, <laughs> I think before we get there, I think I should say like, there's way more ho homophobic shit in this movie than I remembered there being. <laughs> and rewatching it was definitely a thing of like, wow, 2009 was a different era, my friend. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot of homophobic shit in this. So if you have not seen the movie and that's triggering for you, probably set this aside there's a whole lot of anti-gay bullshit here um but i quite like you know i don't know how you know you and i often have very different opinions about like what good acting looks like but um everyone who ever <laughs> everyone who ever uh uh worked with james gandolfini or met him had uh positive memories of him like apparently at one of the press junkets for one of his movies he literally like got behind the counter and tended bar because the bartender was busy and he had like come up as a bartender back in his days you know so, sort of thing and you see a lot of stories like that about gandolfini and i think he's pretty phenomenal here um so you know again burn me if you like no no i i i think he's great i think the acting is pretty uniformly good uh right i i don't like this style i just don't like this style of humor to be honest sure. um and i think maybe that's and, a difference because i actually do quite like you know a lot of the I, I like this this sort of you know the single camera you know uh comedy I, I i do kind of i do find this amusing so maybe that's another uh just a stylistic difference yeah between you and i it, it it may just be that you know because i didn't i i i know i've seen this before uh, so when I watched it for this, it would have been the second time I'd seen it. Uh, I didn't laugh once. I didn't think oh. it was remotely funny. Not once. No, no, that's a lie. That's a lie. There was one line. I can't even remember what it was, but there was line. There was one line that made me laugh. Uh, but yeah, this is just not my style of of comedy. This sort of comedy based on uh, uh, embarrassment and cruelty and humiliation. It just puts my back up. I'm afraid. Um, so maybe maybe all my uh, my deep political problems with it are just rationalizations for the fact that it just puts my back up on that primal level. <laughs> I don't know. I think I think it's pretty clever. I think the writing is often like even if we even if we set aside the sort of the political realities of it, I think the the writing is often clever, and there are some like some really nice like turns of phrase kind of over and over again. And uh, what I've seen described the most creative swearing you've ever seen in a movie. 
Um, and so much of that is like Peter Capaldi himself. Um, I find, you know, I, I think again, you kind of approach it now and I approach it as, as, uh, um, something that I'm doing for like for the podcast and, you know, like have to take a more critical eye towards it. Um, it's a lot harder to, to, uh, to get into it in the same way, but uh, like I do, I do find this uh, pleasurable to to watch at least. Um, and I think maybe the issue is that you that you just don't, and uh, you know that that definitely colors um, how we feel about it uh, overall, for sure. Yeah, but I, I I will say, I mean, I I I think that is a big part of it, but I do just fundamentally dislike uh, Inucci's worldview. You know, he is very much the uh, the, the the centrist. Um, the uh, if we could all just get around the table, you know, and uh, th- right. that sort of thing, uh, and yeah, put our think, ideological differences aside. I think I have the advantage also of this being the only property of his I've ever really taken time with. I know he did Veep, um, which I know Anna Trump- Klumsky is also in that. Apparently, she uh, got nominated for a bunch of awards for her performance there. And I, I'm tempted now to go and watch Veep just to see uh, what he did um with with her and uh I, julia louis dreyfus um but i've I never have, seen it and i didn't even know he was involved in it. yeah no no that was that was he came to america he, he went to hbo um after this and started making veep um and that's his that's his kind of big thing and apparently i mean i've i have like read enough kind of political journalists kind of talking off the record and you know kind of in places where they're not being published in their you know, day job who will basically say like yeah, there's there's a lot in this that that feels very um, very apt, you know. Like there's a um, yeah, particularly around uh, like the, the kind of the the abusive behavior of some of the uh, characters um, in the show um, got got a very uh, unfavorably compared to Amy Klobuchar. <laughs> um you know the the, <laughs> yeah. the the bit like the the thing that we all heard where uh you know she for she had to eat a salad with a comb because uh the staffer didn't get her a, a fork and then she forced the staffer to go clean the comb afterwards um that feels very much like it could have come out of this movie um yeah, I heard something about Amy Klobuchar um, chucking staplers at people or something. That yeah, was, yeah. I mean, it was another one, wasn't it? Yeah. A- Amy Klobuchar is one of those people who, you know, like being a being a sitting U.S. senator is one of those things. That, you know, it is enormously it is an enormously powerful position, and uh, people who were as the as the film kind of shows you, people who work under incredibly powerful people tend to uh, not talk about that uh, precisely because. <laughs> their careerist or because they they you know <laughs> the, you know whatever right amy yeah, klobuchar yeah. the fact that we get any kind of coverage out of her any kind of stories like that out of her <laughs> implies she is an absolute fucking monster <laughs> like, you know, like imagine the worst boss you've ever had and then like multiply by 10 <laughs> that that's kind yeah, of what yeah uh, that's kind of the impression i get about what working for amy klobuchar is like uh, but people do it because um it's good for your career yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. like, uh, the the other thing I associate with Amy Klobuchar is um, during the um, you know the the Democratic uh, primary right. race, you know, to to get the nomination is uh, Bill Maher saying, "Oh, I'm looking very seriously at Amy Klobuchar," and then sort of looking at the camera with this look on his face, like aren't I clever? You weren't <laughs> expecting that, were you, everybody? Because I know politics. I'm really clever. And just just look, just watching that and thinking, you absolute fucking dick. That's one <laughs> right. of my main I, I don't think I, I don't think I, I don't think I uh, I paid enough attention to Bill Maher to know whether or not what his feelings about Amy Klobuchar were. And I feel like that was a good choice on my part. Instead, I was tracking it was, Nazis yeah. at that time. No, I'm just I'm too online. I'm too on Twitter. These things come <laughs> past me. You know? Right. Um, yeah, no, it's fine. I, I miss snake emoji day. Like apparently, you know, and I am very <laughs> on Twitter. And this was very much like a thing I should have noticed. And apparently I was just busy on snake emoji day and just completely went past me. And apparently um, a bunch of people sitting snake emojis on Twitter is enough to completely change the direction of us politics for the next 30 years. Um, apparently yeah. that's, that's, that's the world we live in now. Um, so Twitter, yeah. it's good actually. <laughs> <laughs> anyway i i feel i feel like i mean you know like if you're i don't know if you listen to this conversation you haven't seen the movie 
if you like kind of the cringe comedy, if you like the, if you like Arrested Development, you like, you know, The Office, the U.S. Office at least, um, you know, give it, give it a shot. I think it's, I think it's worth watching. There's a lot of good stuff in it. Um, it is a kind of a time capsule of an era, and I'm not even talking about 2003. I'm kind of talking about 2009 here. It very much is a, 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 a time capsule to that particular moment in um in comedy and i think comedy is one of those things i mean this is a kind of a cliche i mean it is a cliche that you know nothing ages faster than comedy does right um and i think that's you know that's something that like again re-watching it now you definitely i could definitely see the seams that i didn't see when i saw it you know in my early 30s right so um but i do think it, i do think it's probably worth you know uh, an hour and 45 minutes of your time uh, if you choose to if you choose to view it um uh, there's a lot of good stuff in it but uh, it, it has its problems so <laughs> that's where i land it's pretty bleak it, it, yeah. um and it yeah it is it is very much of that era and that style of comedy that i personally don't like uh, and which does yeah uh, it's it's very much of that moment and i think it's of its moment in another way which is that it's years removed from the political events that it's obsessed with and yet it's still it still feels like kind of you know centrism picking at the scab you know it can't leave it alone it has to keep going back and kind of worrying at it you know and and that's that's a very 2009 thing you know just after yeah. obama gets just after obama gets in this this kind of this simultaneous feeling of Right, Bush is gone. Obama is here now. Everything's fine. And then, sort of un- underneath that, kind of this, yeah, but it, yeah, but it's still, it kind of, it didn't quite. It still happened, didn't it? You know, it's got that anxiety about it. That um, it's right. all over, except that it's not, and it never will be. That's what it feels like <laughs> right. to me. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that was yeah, um, that was that, that was, was a bonus episode. That was a bonus episode. We um, yeah, <laughs> we talked about this a lot more than we talked about the third man when we did the third man episode. So you know, there is that. Yeah, I remember the third man. Uh, like we talked for you know an hour and a half, and kind of we we did the oh yeah, Orson Welles is quite good, isn't he? In the last <laughs> right. five minutes, didn't we? <laughs> That's pretty much it. I think we referenced the uh, the cuckoo clock bit, and um, you know, uh, we mostly just talked about vaccines at that point. So. Um, <laughs> vaccines what could that be in uh, which what, what will the what, what will the satirical response to our current moment be do you think i mean how do you even begin to well, I, encompass I, I feel i feel like like a lot of the i was going to you know we went in a different direction which is fine but i was going to reference you know all the kind of like fumbling around at the cdc and fauci and masks and not masks and you know should we you know because like my country my my my, my nation the cdc in may said um no if you're vaccinated you don't have to wear a mask anymore things are fine now um and then yeah. uh, everybody stopped wearing a mask um although i'm still wearing it in public places because of the delta variant which is now like yeah. something like 83 percent of all cases in the u.s uh, that have been sequenced by pcr are uh, delta variant um and it's uh, much more infectious uh, than uh previous versions um and so now the cdc has come out and gone we are encouraging people strongly to mask again in public <laughs> places, you know. And uh, again, because of the because of the political realities, uh, the governor of my state, Gretchen Whitmer, who uh, there's a complicated thing going on with the uh, the case against the the people who were kidnapping her, which we could do a whole IDSG on. Like, there's not so much bullshit, but we're just I'm like that's been that's been covered elsewhere better than I can cover it here. But um, <laughs> literally, like the day after the the CDC put that out there, she she went in public and was like, um, "No, we're not going to enforce a mask mandate. I encourage you to wear one if you choose to, but um, we're just going to rely on vaccinations at this point." And like that's the that's the 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 liberals are broken completely on this at this point. Yeah, um, because she yeah. has been so boxed in by the Republicans at. at in the state in the state government where she really doesn't have an option anymore they 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 are they are i want to say figuratively but almost literally out for her blood at this point and um she's she sees the writing on the wall like there's nothing even if i even if i enforced it there's nothing i can do about it at this point like they have literally stripped her of emergency powers to prevent her from being able to to enforce a mask mandate so um that's what living in michigan is like right now by the way um and so again i see a lot of parallels between the sort of like 
the the fumbling around and sort of the, the people obeying the politics of the moment as opposed to the large longer term politics that's in in the loop in sort of like the local covid response in, in a lot of ways yeah no i mean it, it it's interesting um I, I I said, you know, how will how will the satire of, of a few years down the line even begin to encompass what we're what we're currently going through? Um, what is currently? I mean, how do you how do you satirize? How do you satirize this? The 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 response uh, to the question of masking in public and social distancing in right. the midst of a pandemic and the way people have responded to it. Um, it it's just. I'm, I don't know. I don't know that it's possible. I feel like I, I feel like we're possible. just. I feel like we're just never going to get like the real like the COVID movie, right? I feel like it's just such a thing that we've all gone through, and yeah. that um, you know it, it's kind of like you know after World War II. Uh, I mean, you did get sort of like some dramas, and you got like a bunch of kind of rah rah war movies, but you know it was it was fairly non ideological. It was fairly just sort of. Um, you know, not really confronting the enormity of, of what actually happened and more just kind of like entertainment. But I feel like COVID is just sort of kind of one of those things. Like I was saying to my, to my wife, um, uh, you know, a few, a few, I mean, a few months ago, actually, is that, you know, this is going to be the era in which we just kind of look back to like SNL performances and go like, oh, this is the era in which everybody in the background is wearing a mask, you know, and that'll be the, that'll be the thing. Oh, right. The pandemic was happening then. But I also yeah. think the pandemic, yeah. well, this is going to be something we're kind of living with for years. Like, I mean, it's just sort of the reality of it is we didn't hit it hard enough when we had the chance. And now no. it's just kind of here with us. And I was kind of reading some stuff about, um, look, <laughs> the, the, this ends when, you know, 80% of the population is seropositive, is, is blood positive for this um, spike protein. And you either yeah. get that by, you either get the vaccine or you get the, you get the virus. The, the, there's, that's it. Those are the two ways you get it. Yeah. And so when yeah. 80% of the population worldwide is um, seropositive, uh, this becomes uh, something that's, that, that this kind of goes away. And maybe it kind of pops up here and there. Maybe it becomes you get your yearly COVID shot alongside your flu shot or whatever. But um, the chance of this like just going away completely, um, we we completely botched that idea. Like you know, just as a society, oh, we yeah, failed yeah. at that. You know, and maybe yeah. there was no way to actually do that properly. You know, in March of 2020, um, maybe just based on the systems at large in the world uh, there was just no possible way of really kind of making it happen um I, I mean i would be very sympathetic to that idea is that this was just kind of beyond us uh at, at that you know at that level of knowledge but at this point it's you know we we do have the ability to do it now we know enough now to know how to fix it but it's it's um it's just it's something we get to live with for the rest of our lives i mean you know so yay covid <laughs> joy yeah. pure joy sorry i'm i'm yeah. very i you know like i don't want to like feel like you know this is a downer podcast or anything but i have been i have been very much like i i had somebody because i mentioned the existence of the pa- despair i feel about like any article about climate change you know yeah. um yeah. that's another issue that you know we just Everyone with any level of sense has known for 30 years that climate change was going yeah. to come and kill us all. And we have yeah. done jack shit about it. Like as, as, yeah. as, as, a, as a planet, we have done virtually nothing. And even like the Green New Deal, that is the like moderate centrist position thing that we should have done in 1991 if we were going to take this yeah. seriously, right? Like yeah. we are multiple decades into completely not doing anything meaningful about this and getting into like the Paris Climate Accords is not like a thing that's going to make any kind of real difference to the world, right? Uh, it's, just, it's just not like it, we should do it. We should do the little bit as opposed to nothing. It would be nice. But like fundamentally, this problem is just beyond us. Everyone with any level of knowledge about the way the world works sees how terrible this is. Um, the scientists who are like, <laughs> who have been researching this stuff for years, like they're like very sourced evidence-based pronouncements of like the, the stark 
reality, like the bare bones reality of what they say about this sound like the rantings of a madman, because that's how far, that's how far gone this is. And yeah. this, it's just, this is the world. This is, this, this is where, this is where we are. Right. And so <laughs> I don't know. I'm not trying to depress everybody, but uh, this this is where my headspace is these days. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, and I feel I feel you know we're 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 winding up now, but I feel like uh, you can see the whole thing playing out, kind of in miniature in microcosm in the story of the uh, the invasion of Iraq. You know, everybody knows, and the the powers that be push ahead with their i mean in, in that case it's an action rather than inaction but it still kind of works uh pushed by this mixture of self-interest and just utterly deluded ideological commitment to empire and and capital and so on that they just can't that you know the self-interest and the ideology can't be pulled apart they're essentially the same thing and everybody knows it's wrong and it's just coming and the fact of it coming just becomes this inescapable thing this inescapable rolling boulder and you can have essentially the biggest protest movement in human history you know occur mm-hmm. and and the the system just kind of goes and then people go home and it happens anyway and it leads to and it leads to absolute carnage and as people are are suffering and dying in in staggering numbers uh there's this corporate feeding frenzy going on uh people people should re- this, this is one of the things people forget about this uh you know, Iraq after the invasion, when the country was basically broken up and sold off like a corporation that had been taken over, you know. Right. Um, Naomi Klein wrote a book about this quite soon after the invasion, which obviously, you know, it's probably been superseded, but it's a good little book. Uh, and it, it was just absolutely outrageous what they did. They basically treated this this country full of human beings. Firstly, they smashed their way in, um, having tortured and prostrated the country for, for a very long time previously, smashed their way in, kill many, many people. You know, the numbers are debated, but it's probably a it's probably a million. At least, at least half a million. And at least half a million. Yeah. At least half a million, yeah. And you know, the British public pers- when polled persistently estimate Iraqi dead at like, you know, four thousand or something like that, which is a statistic <laughs> that just makes me want to kill myself in shame and horror and rage um but they and they they do this uh for uh as i say you can't you can't pull apart the ideology and the venal self-interest because essentially they're the same thing in in looked at from different angles and i just feel like it's it's this little cameo of of the of the horror we're facing now this this just this this system that rolls on completely unstoppable despite the fact that apart from this tiny layer of people whose job is to make it function and this even tinier layer above them who have this uh, ideological commitment to it, everybody is funny. Well, no, that's the, it's not that everybody's against it because uh, huge numbers of, you know, Americans are massing in their millions to not get the vaccine and not get their... Uh, not not have to wear a mask, aren't they? Right. Oh God, it's even this. This is what I'm talking myself round. You know, it's worse. It's worse, <laughs> right? Now. Because what we've what we've done now is we've got. It's like the invasion of Iraq as a metaphor, except that now we've got millions of people marching, saying, "No, I want to go to Iraq and be underneath the white phosphorus." <laughs> right. I mean, and, uh, well, that, that's not even. That's not even like it's. It's even more cynical than that, because what really happened at least as i again the before times april 2020 right (laughs) what really happened was there were some outbreaks in like detroit and in new york city and in a couple of other places that were like really really bad um i mean you know like i know people i know people who were living in new york at the time um who would say like it was you, you would hear ambulance sirens all day and all night just constant you know it was just that that's just what life was like you know bodies being like stacked into like freezer vans in detroit staggeringly brutal wasn't it staggering yeah but like and all so many of those bodies were of a particular skin color right yeah (laughs) so many of those people well that's it Right. That is, of um, course, a huge factor that I haven't even, you know, we haven't even mentioned that. But, right. Yeah. But but so many, so much of this was 
if you were, and I think I mentioned this on the podcast at some point, I think I'm, we're repeating ourselves a little bit here, but like, it's fine to repeat ourselves slightly. If you're, if you're living in the state of Michigan and you're in the upper peninsula, like, and you live in a cabin somewhere like far away from like anyone else, Detroit feels like this, like very distant. It might as well be Mars from your opinion, you know, from, 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 you know, COVID doesn't feel like a thing that's going to come and get you. Right. And if you don't know anybody who got it and you don't know anybody who's really, you know, like dealt with that, then like, it's, then you just kind of look at it and go, This is something happening far away that I don't have to deal with, which, you know, I I said it earlier when it was happening in China, part of my emotional response was this is a thing that's happening in China that I don't have to deal with again, very human response, right? Like it's a very, like, there are people who are going to take care of this. There are, you know, like this is something that, and, and I feel like that in addition to the way it was politicized by Trump and the way it was used as this kind of political tool. And then suddenly like the mask mandates and, you know, like kind of forcing people to do this simple thing that actually like helps transmission, but all you can, or helps, helps to prevent transmission of this virus. But that feels like kind of an obligation and an annoyance in this kind of like nanny state. You're not allowed to have a soda larger than a certain size, or, you know, you got to wear your seatbelt kind of like the stuff that like people, the, the impositions into their personal lives that people just feel, you know, ugly about people just feel like it's just like, I just don't want to do it. And I don't want to do it mostly because I'm being told I have to buy some, you know, <laughs> some 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 lady kind of harang- haranguing me on the TV or whatever, right? Um, that response is like kind of irrational as it is. Does have a certain like you sort of get how people get there, right? You know, you sort of get that like kind of basic logic of I'm not seeing it. It's not something that's affecting me. This is overblown. It's only killing a tiny percentage of the people that it affects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And but well, then and there's lots of people queuing up to take their money in return for telling them that their worst instincts are completely right as well. Aren't exactly, they? exactly. And that's what makes I mean, again, we've been kind of on the Brett and Heather kick and the ivermectin stuff, you know, that's part of what makes that so um dangerous. And so, you know, is that you know, regardless, I mean, I think Brett and Heather do believe in what they're saying about ivermectin. I don't know, I have my I have my um I do have my personal uh, opinion about whether or not they actually did go surreptitiously get the vaccine for themselves. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, yeah. I, I can't make it, I can't make a, a st- I can't make an informed statement about that, but like, you know, um, it's a thing, you know, um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm rambling <laughs> here, but I don't know. I think you see kind of the, the point of kind of where I'm going with the, yeah, the way yeah. the COVID and the way that the kind of interaction of it has, you know, it, it definitely affects our kind of political culture. Like there's a big, like there is, I think a satire to be made, but I think that either it has to be like completely on the nose or it has to be like so abstract that it's not even like connected specifically to the COVID moment, you know? Um, and maybe it takes us 10 years to really get there. Maybe and satire is kind of useless anyway. <laughs> this is the problem. <laughs> that's uh, that's unfortunate. You know, you want you feel like it should be. It feels so good to get a good satire that you feel like it yeah. should be. It should be like protest music. You feel like it makes you feel good, and feeling good is its own reward. You feel like that should be effective in itself. But um, the Vietnam War still happened, and there was a ton of great protest music um, in the sixties. So um, yeah. But uh, we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was that de- that depressing Vonnegut quote? You know, every great, every good artist in the '60s was against the war, and the collective effect of their opposition was I, I can't remember what the what the it thing was, said, uh, it was. It was about the about the effect of a wet fart or something to that effect. Yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, yeah. which I don't think is quite true, but even so. <laughs> Well, and I mean, if we if we if we want to end on a, on a positive note, I mean, you know, one of the things that the the, the kind of the, the anti war movement did was kind of build a um, was to build a kind of culture 
this 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 kind of counterculture moment, which did have long term effects, even if it couldn't stop the war, it did um, change things. I mean, you know, the the gay rights era certainly kind of comes yeah. out of yeah. you know that kind of stuff. I mean, a lot of the uh, racial equality stuff. I mean, there were tons of positive downstream impacts, um, even if they didn't have the uh, even if they couldn't stop the, stop the war. And so, you know, mm-hmm. organizing and kind of using these things and doing these things is important. I mean, we do this podcast because I think it actually does make a difference if we do it versus if we don't. Um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, satire maybe has that same, you know, kind of longer term effect. Um, and look, the, you know. the 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 massive uh, anti-war movement of that era of the 2003 era uh, that has had its its effects, very beneficial effects. I mean, it failed to achieve its actual immediate objective, but uh, there's been a lot of uh, building on that on that global organization of a mass movement against the against what by any reasonable standards i think was a horrific uh atrocity against uh against humanity and um you know i was part of it at the time i don't call myself anti-war i i definitely anti-imperialist um i'm not a pacifist but i um but yeah that's uh, that's kind of by the by but um yeah it it, it did build you know, and it, it it itself was built upon previous movements um, against uh, Vietnam War, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And to kind of bring this back round and and tie a little bow on it, we we started talking earlier about um, uh, very trivially and irrelevantly about how when I was a kid, I remember TV starting to go through the night. And I was I was staying up to watch stuff that they just used to put on in the wee small hours. And one of the things they used to do on ITV was they had this thing where a guy would present uh, like a, a like a phone in choice thing between movies. He would say, "Right, what what movie do you want to, us to show? Do you want us to show this movie, or do you want us to show that movie?" And you'd phone in, and the, the one with the most number of votes would be the one that they'd show. And that is how I, at the age of I don't know twelve saw Lindsay Anderson's movie If, Ooh. Um, which is an amazing film. And that is a, that is a, it is a satire in many respects uh, of both um, the, the English public school system, the English class system, and just English society generally. And it's also a, a revolutionary film. It's a film that, um, that basically advocates revolutionary violence, you know, revolution. And that film had an enormous effect on me. So the, you know, these things do, uh, these things do have their effects. I think it's an immeasurably better film than in the loop, in my opinion. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think I would agree. So yes. Um, all right. I think, I think we, 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 get, we, we said, we were going to do this in about an hour and we've now been going on almost two. So I think we should wrap up. Have we really? Yeah, me, it no, doesn't feel yeah, that long. No, I mean, it was like, yeah, I wouldn't have guessed. We had to, okay. we had to spend 30 minutes talking about uh, cable TV before we could really we get did. into it. You know? <laughs> because <laughs> we had to do that. Yeah. <laughs> that was it, very we were forced important. to by, uh, by, by uh, the systems that work above us uh, kind of forcing like capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, no, no. The cable TV diversion was a very important part <laughs> of the overall thesis. I insist <laughs> upon I insist upon that. Okay. Uh, well, that was bonus episode number seven on yep. In the Loop, yep. uh, amongst other things. And yeah, we'll be back with another bonus episode next month. We just made it for, for July. We just we just squeaked a bonus in. Um, <laughs> if you you just got to get it up within the next uh, you know uh, eighteen hours or so. <laughs> I'm going to. I'm going to. Don't worry. All right. <laughs> All right. Great. And we'll be back. Was it, this was my choice, wasn't it? So you get to choose. The no, next I one. I think. We this originally came about because uh, Donald Rumsfeld died, and I said we need to do something about the Iraq War yeah. so I could really dig into Donald Rumsfeld, and uh, we didn't do that at all. Um, so we I, didn't I, even no. Yeah, I guess we this should was do. Um, I guess this was technically should, your choice, but you know, yeah, what do you what do you want to do? We should do known unknowns, then. we should do Rumsfeld properly next time. Oh, uh, maybe. Well, we've already done one Errol Morris, and. Uh, yeah i don't know we'll think about it we'll think about it we'll think it's up to you yeah Yeah. okay well uh the the listener will just have to wait and see and in the meantime bye-bye bye that was i don't speak german 
Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show or found it useful, please spread the word. If you want to contact me, I'm at underscore Jack underscore Graham underscore. Daniel is at Daniel E. Harper. And the show's Twitter is at IDSGpod. If you want to help us make the show and stay 100% editorially independent, we both have Patreons. I Don't Speak German is hosted at I Don't Speak German dot Libsyn dot com. And we're also on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, and we show up in all podcast apps. This show is associated with Eruditorum Press, where you can find more details about it. The music was by Loon the Band.